Hey folks, George here. Today we're going to continue our discussion uh, about the philosophical question, who am I? Or who are you? We'll recall in the uh, previous two videos, we talked about uh, rationalists and empiricists who both arrived at a dualist solution to the question, who am I? And the dualist solution is ultimately, I am truly the real George is a soul, an immaterial soul, which is distinct from the material body and the material world. It's made of, this soul is made of something totally different. It's a totally different substance. And that's why they call this school or this uh, position in philosophy dualism, two different substances that create uh, existence. Then we saw, of course, Hume, who uh, a, a famous empiricist philosopher who concludes through his perceptions that there is no self, there is no mind, there is no uh, soul. Why? Because I never perceive or experience a self or a soul or anything like that. I merely perceive perceptions like pain and cold, etc., etc. Then we left last time with Kant's philosophy, which was quite revolutionary in its transcendental uh, direction. That is, it went backwards and said, wait a second, Hume, I don't merely have senses that pass through a theater, as Hume uh, suggested. Rather, the experiences I have are understood and organized and synthesized in a manner such that I can make sense of such experiences. I understand such experiences. Therefore, Kant says, I must be more than a theater where mere perceptions simply pass through, right? I must be that thing that synthesizes experiences, that constructs experiences and constructs the real e world around me so that I understand it. Now we're going to explore several different philosophers here who go in a radically different direction than either of those. Well, some of them more like Hume, some of them less like Hume, but all quite interesting in their very modern approach. All of the philosophers that I'm going to discuss uh, worked and came to their uh, theories and developed their ideas uh, in the 20th century, in the 1900s. The first philosopher that I will discuss who tries to answer the question, who am I today, is Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud was a philosopher in the early 20th century who developed a very radical notion of the self. Freud starts with some ideas that seem rather intuitive, actually, but then he really puts forward a very counterintuitive uh, idea. His, the first idea that is rather intuitive is that we do have conscious experiences. Uh, I'm having this conscious experience right now. I see the camera in front of me. I feel the body uh, that this is right now. Uh, I hear different noises. I feel the air around me. I'm conscious of all those ideas. He also uh, grants another obvious position, obvious to many of us, which is there's pre-conscious ideas and pre-conscious thoughts. That is, thoughts that can come up to the conscious rather easily. For example, perhaps you weren't thinking this, but if you, uh, yeah, I'll assume for a second that you weren't thinking this. Uh, when is your birthday? Now, I'm assuming that you weren't thinking about your birthday uh, 10 seconds ago. However, when I asked, when is your birthday, that idea popped into your conscious experience rather quickly. And what Freud, uh, that's what Freud would call pre-conscious experience. Now, here's where Freud, yeah, goes way past left field. I, I think he goes, yeah, further than left field. He, he, he leaves the ballpark with this new idea. And his new idea is the unconscious right? It's not merely pre-conscious because, yeah, I already have a lot of unconscious ideas and unconscious beliefs that I'm aware of in the old language, but he trains or re-labels those as pre-conscious ideas. So what is the unconscious for Freud? Freud is going to say that there's unconscious thoughts, unconscious beliefs that you have right now but you're not even aware that you have them. They're deep down inside, right? Um, what sort of unconscious beliefs do I have? Well, by definition, I can't know. 
I don't know what unconscious beliefs I have because by definition, I can't, I don't have access to my unconscious mind. Unconscious mind versus conscious mind. It sounds like the only way I could really make sense of this is that Freud is suggesting that there are two minds in this self. There's a conscious mind and an unconscious mind. And there are, yeah, in old Cartesian sort of language, right? It sounds like there's actually two persons that are part of me. There's a conscious person, a person that I'm very conscious of, and there's an unconscious person who is different from me. Now, to help flesh out this idea a little bit more, I'm going to use one of Freud's more uh, controversial ideas, right? And some of you fans of Freud will uh, jump out at me and say that I'm not really, uh, uh, I, I, I'm skewing the notion of the Oedipal complex, right? Quite a bit here. And that might be true. The, my point isn't to share with you all the nitty-gritty details of the Oedipal complex. Rather, my point here is merely to show how the unconscious mind and conscious mind makes sense within this Freudian framework. So, Freud will tell me, Freud does tell me, more or less, that I want to have sex with my own mother. What do I respond? I say, no way, Freud. That's sick. That's disgusting. I do not want to have sex with my mother. And he says, consciously, you believe that. However, unconsciously, you do want to have sex with your mother. You have a belief in here such that you want to have sex with your mother. Now, is that uh, word for word uh, uh, a very clear idea of Freud's theories? Not exactly. But I think this uh, e even my uh, poor translation of his ideas does make clear how the unconscious works. I have beliefs, according to Freud, that I don't even know I have. Not only do I not know that I have these ideas, but I deny, consciously, I deny that I have these beliefs, like the belief to have sex with my mother, for example. That's really the kind of thing that Freud is saying here. This is quite different from Plato's earlier idea of with the chariot analogy. Plato suggested that the soul is like a charioteer who's trying to control two wild horses, right? And those two wild horses are the physical appetites and passionate or emotional appetites, right? The thing about that theory, the platonic version of this, is that I know my physical appetites, and I know my emotional appetites. Freud is suggesting that there's somewhere in here a whole other set of beliefs that I don't even know I have. That is what's wild. So, let me step back for a second because some philosophers will suggest that this is, uh, 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 leads to a contradiction, doesn't it? What Freud is kind of saying, to, in a certain degree, is I believe, oh, excuse me, I want to have sex with my mother, and I don't want to have sex with my mother. I have both beliefs. That seems self-contradictory. Now, that's different, again, from saying that I have conflicting beliefs, like I want to eat this chocolate cake, but there's a part of me that doesn't want to eat the chocolate cake, and there's a conflict, right? I think Freud is putting forward an idea that's so much more self-contradictory and so much more radical, such that not that I have two conflicting beliefs, but that I actually deny that I have a belief that I have. How to make sense of this? I believe something that I deny I believe. How can we make sense of that? Well, again, the only way that I can make sense of this is to suggest that it's as though there are two selves. There are two people in here. I am made up of at least two people. The conscious George, who says, I don't want to have sex with my mother, 
And deep, 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 deep down inside, I don't even, I'm not even aware of it. There's a self somewhere in there that says, I do want to have sex with my mother. Right? That sounds fairly radical. How can Freud support such crazy ideas? Well, one way that he's going to support these ideas is through neuroses and certain uh, mental ailments that we suffer. What are some of these neuroses? Well, a, a classic neurosis, uh, neurotic behavior might be uh, what some people call uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, right? Where people want to lock the door a certain amount of times before leaving. And what Freud is going to put forward is that these kind of neurotic behaviors are actually the unconscious self trying to exert itself on this body, right? And that's the kind of proof that Freud gives for this sort of uh, theory that there are two selves, a conscious self and an unconscious self within this one self. Am I oneself anymore? Whereas Descartes would say, I think, therefore I am. It seems to me that Freud is going to say something like, I think, and also I think, way down here, I also think, therefore I am, unconsciously and consciously present. Right? There's two I thinks. I think and I think, therefore, I am, which takes a lot of people uh, uh, more than a minute to wrap their heads around. Some philosophers have a problem with this because there is an element to Freud's philosophy that is unfalsifiable. What does unfalsifiable mean? You can't prove Freud wrong. And doesn't that make this kind of idea, an idea that you can't prove wrong, doesn't that make it a little bit uh, less reasonable to believe? Because whenever you try to prove Freud wrong, and I say, no, Freud, I'm sorry, Sigmund, I don't want to have sex with my mother. What is Freud always going to say? Oh, yeah, yeah, you, you don't know you do, but unconsciously you do. He always has that trick that he could play. It's like a philosophical trick. That makes his theory unfalsifiable. We can't prove Freud wrong because he's always got this trick in his back pocket that says, oh, it's just unconscious. That makes many philosophers um, try to discount his theory because of its unfalsifiability. Right? However, there is something that's interesting about it, if I want to be a bit charitable to Freud, such that he does try to make sense of neurotic behavior and neuroses that we suffer. How do we do this? Isn't it because there's a part of us that is trying to express itself in one way or another? Whether it's uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, whether it's uh, schizophrenia, whether it's any number of other uh, mental ailments that challenge us sometimes, right? And Freud, I think, should be applauded for trying to make sense of these. Whether we believe that there are two selves in all of us or not. Well, what do you think? Now we're going to get to the monist philosophers who are pure materialists. What does that mean? They're going to suggest that there really is only one realm of existence, the material realm, the physical world, and that there is not an additional realm called the spiritual realm or the realm of thinking things or the realm of minds or souls or those sorts of things. These philosophers are going to say there's only material existence. The first philosopher that I want to talk about in this vein is Gilbert Ryle. Gilbert Ryle put forward a philosophy called behaviorism. So when he asks the question, when John J.P. asks the question, who am I? Gilbert Ryle is going to answer, you are your pattern of behaviors. You are the way you act. There's something to me that's intuitively nice about this, right? Because after all, I do uh, uh, sometimes say to people, listen, don't tell me what you believe. Show me what you believe, right? There's another old uh, idiom, if you will, that says your actions speak louder than your words. I think Gilbert Ryle would uh, like 
that sort of idiom. Although he, to be technical, I think Gilbert Ryle would say that your words are actions. When you speak, you are performing behavior, and that is how we're going to solve some of the nitty-gritty problems of behaviorism here. So what Gilbert Ryle is going to say is everything that you call a self is merely a pattern of behaviors, your whole pattern of behaviors. By the way, this solves a problem that Descartes didn't address, where Descartes says, I think, therefore I am. The problem emerges, well, how do you prove that anybody else exists as a, as a mind, as a soul? Descartes can't prove that especially well. I know that I have a mind, but how do I know that you have a mind and you're not just a robot? Well, Gilbert Ryle doesn't have that problem. If you be if you behave like you have a mind, then you have a mind. If you behave a certain way, then you are a person. And that's the solution. To really flesh out this philosophy, Gilbert Ryle is going to say, there is no ghost in the machine. Because that's really what Descartes' philosophy and Plato's philosophy tried to put forward. That there's some sort of ghost or soul driving this body. Right? Plato actually calls it a charioteer. Yeah. Whereas Ryle is going to say there is no ghost. It's all just body. And it's all just body behaving with certain patterns. Gilbert Ryle wants to reduce all talk of mental phenomenon to mere behavioral phenomenon. Now I'll tell you what, as a teacher, I like this. Right? I, I, as a teacher. I really put this into action. How? Because a student might come up to me and say, wait a second, I know this material. I'm like, great, show me that you know the material, right? Take this test or write this paper or pass this exam. Prove to me through your behavior that you know some material. So all knowledge, according to Gilbert Ryle, is merely certain patterns of behavior. Do you know math? Here's how Gilbert Ryle would prove if somebody knows math or not, or basic arithmetic. Well, you ask them a question. What is 2 plus 2? If that person behaves in a manner such that they answer 4, then guess what? That person knows arithmetic. And that's all there is to it. Now, of course, we'll have to ask them a whole other series of questions. If they behave in a manner such that they answer correctly to mathematical questions, then we can say that person knows math, certain math, right? Same thing with anything else, any other mental phenomenon. What does it mean to say, I'm in pain? Gilbert Ryle is going to say, oh, all that I'm in pain really means is, right? Ouch! People behave in certain manners. What are some of those manners? Well, they say ouch when they hurt. They hold their the place of pain. Their face kind of does one of these. Maybe they cry. Right? And that's all that pain really is. What is thirst? According to Gilbert Ryle, what is the feeling of thirst? Gilbert Ryle is going to say that all reduces to mere behavior, such that if you put a glass of water in front of a person who says, I'm thirsty, that person will drink it. And now you chalk up any other mental phenomenon that you want, right? Of course, they're going to be very complicated and they're going to be uh, uh, coupled with very complicated patterns of behavior. But that's ultimately what all mental phenomena will reduce to is patterns of behavior. One of the fun ones that I like talking about is love. What is love? And that one seems to be most controversial, right? How do you show that you love somebody? Oh boy. Yeah, I feel like a lot of uh, romantic relationships have been ruined because we are, in fact, all behaviorists. So Gilbert Ryle will suggest. Because that person doesn't treat me in a certain way, Therefore, I say that person doesn't love me. Isn't that how a lot of relationships uh, end, unfortunately? Because people don't behave in a loving manner.
Gilbert Ryle. Now, is this, uh, uh, does this answer all the problems? Of course, patterns like love, even pain, is going to be very, very complicated and a lot more uh, complicated than I have uh, shown here. I've just really over, oversimplified these phenomena. So think about that, and that's how Gilbert Ryle is going to talk about mental phenomena. One more thing about Gilbert Ryle that I find quite brilliant. He suggests that when we do talk about minds and selves and souls, he's saying that we're all performing a category error. What is a category error? Well, he gives us, he fleshes out this example. He says, imagine you take your friends to a university. You show your friend the buildings. You show your friend the students. You show your friends the, your friend the laboratories. You show your friend the sports teams and uh, the professors and the quads. And then your friend says, yes, you've shown me the buildings. You've shown me the, uh, the students. You've shown me the professors. You've shown me all that. But where's the university? Gilbert Ryle's saying, you've committed a category error. It's all of this stuff together in a certain relationship, in a certain pattern that makes a university, right? And in the same way, he talks about selves or souls or minds. It's merely patterns of behavior. And that's how he solves a lot of interesting philosophical problems. But doesn't he actually raise more philosophical problems? One that I really like uh, was really illustrated in this uh, film by Julian Schnabel called The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, which recounts uh, a real-life incident of a French journalist named Jean-Dominique Balbi. What happens to him, he gets into an accident and suffers a stroke, and as such, he's left with something called locked-in syndrome. That is, his body cannot move at all. He's paralyzed. Yet, his mind still works. He still has thoughts and experiences and all that stuff. What would Gilbert Ryle say to that kind of syndrome, somebody who has locked-in syndrome? who is paralyzed ultimately and cannot move, cannot behave, does that mean that that person has no mind, has no thoughts, has no feelings? The point of Julian Schnabel's movie here is that such a person might, un through some unfortunate series of events, might exist and has existed before. And yet, there still are mental phenomena. How can you account for that, Gilbert Ryle? By the way, there is a real feeling of love, isn't there? It's not merely behavior. And so Gilbert Ryle seems to be, uh, yeah, not complete in his philosophy, to say the very least. Like I said, as a teacher, I like this philosophy, but I don't think it's a philosophy that takes me through the rest of my life. When I have to judge and say, does this person know mathematics? Behaviorism works great, but for every other aspect in life, I'm not sure that this is the best understanding of other people. We're going to wrap up this question of who am I with the philosopher Paul Churchland. He's going to go into this similar route that David Hume did, but through different pathways. That is, Churchland is an eliminativist. He eliminates the mind. He doesn't think there's any such thing as a mind at all. And that if we really just understood neuroscience, if we understood neuroscience, we would stop talking about minds and what he calls folk psychology. That's just traditional sort of understanding of mental phenomenon. Churchland is a materialist. He doesn't believe in any uh, spiritual being, any spiritual realm. There's only body. And when we talk about minds, he's going to say there is no mind. There's only the brain and the nervous system and it working. And we should eliminate all talk of minds and feelings and thoughts if we really understood how the nervous system works.
Let's give an example of this. I say, for example, I'm in pain. Ouch. I'm in pain. Paul Churchill would say, mm, wrong. There is no such thing as pain. What there is, is certain nerves sparking and going through the nervous system into the brain and signaling the brain in certain ways. That's all there is. Stop talking about pain, for example. I say I'm thirsty. Mm -hmm. Churchill will say there's no such thing as thirst. Thirst is a mental phenomenon. There are no mental phenomenons. What there is, is uh, certain elements of the digestive system, right, uh, that have to do probably with saliva and the tongue and things like this, react in certain ways with the nervous system and send messages to the brain that spark off brain states that you call thirst, but it's not really thirst at all. It's just a series of brain states and electric and chemical reactions in this nervous system. There are no mental phenomenon at all. It's eliminated. How does he put forward this argument? Well, he argues by way of analogy. Way, way back when, there was this imaginary substance called phlogiston. Phlogiston. And the theory went that there is phlogiston inside of everything. Right? There is phlogiston inside of everything. Such that when you burn wood, the phlogiston leaves the wood. And that's why all that's left is ash. When water and iron mix, the phlogiston leaves the iron and leaves rust. Right? That's how the theory of phlogiston worked. What Churchland said is wrong. Right? Science has since proved that this theory of phlogiston is wrong. That's not at all what happens. Rather, what happens when we burn wood? It's not that phlogiston leaves the wood. Rather, oxygen, fire, is mixed with the wood. And oxygen and wood, mixed together, creates ash. Same thing with water and uh, iron. It's not that phlogiston leaves, it's that oxygen combines with the iron to create something new, rust. So what has happened now that we understand chemistry a bit better, now you'll forgive me for my uh, uh, rudimentary understanding of chemistry, but that's more or less what happens. And what has happened to phlogiston? We have stopped talking about phlogiston. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't be surprised if many of you folks listening right now, this is the first time in your whole life that you've ever heard of phlogiston. Why? Because science has developed to a point that we don't talk about phlogiston. We've eliminated phlogiston from our vocabulary, from our beliefs. There is no phlogiston anymore. And so, how do we talk about things? Instead, we talk about chemical reactions. Churchland, Paul Churchland, is going to suggest that the same thing shall happen with neuroscience. Once we really understand neuroscience a whole lot better, what's going to happen? We will stop talking about folk psychology and things like mental phenomenon and minds and feelings and emotions. All of that will be eliminated. Instead, all that will be left is talk about neuroscience and chemicals and electrical reactions and brain states that happen. And once neuroscience gets there, we will eliminate all talk of mental phenomena. Now, some of us might think that this is very dark, and Churchland recognizes this, very dark and pessimistic. However, Churchland suggests, wait a second, this is actually way more uh, empathetic, isn't it? Because how do we today talk about things like depression? Do we merely say, oh, depression, you're just really, really, really sad. Come on, let's get out of bed. Let's just go do something. Come on, let's, let me make you happy. Let me put on a, a comedy show for you to make you more happy. Nobody 
in the 21st century would try to treat depression that way. Rather, it so happens that neuroscience has developed to such a point that we can treat depression much, much more effectively with chemical treatments, namely drugs. Right? Now you pick your favorite antidepressant drug and they actually, for those of us who know people on antidepressants, who, who have been treated successfully with antidepressants, we know people who have been treated better and act better and go, my goodness, I feel so much better because of mere chemical reactions and brain state reactions that certain medications stimulate. Now, obviously, uh, Churchland nor I will suggest that we understand everything about the brain. And I certainly don't think that we understand everything about depression. And I certainly don't think that we are 100% uh, successful at treating depression with drugs. Never would I suggest that. However, Churchland is saying, look how much better we are at treating depression. Don't we call it, many of us call it a medical problem now. And doesn't that help us be more sympathetic to people than merely saying, oh, he's just really, really, really sad. And that, Paul Churchland suggests, will lead to a much kinder, more thoughtful society where we do recognize uh, brain states for what they are, as opposed to translating them into mental states. How does that make you feel? Shall we eliminate all talk of mental phenomena? Would the world be better off that way? Paul Churchland envisions a world that will be better that way. In the far, far future, by the way. It's a lot to chew on. It's a lot to chew on. But what's weird to me is how he says, yeah, we want to be kinder. Isn't kindness, isn't that a mental phenomenon? I'm not sure. So how can we make sense of these sorts of things? How can we make sense of morality or kindness or empathy or treating people better or worse if it's mere brain states? Well, Paul Churchland has made a career of explaining this in greater detail. So if you want to do your research, yeah, look up more of what Paul Churchland has to say about these questions. But next time, we're going to talk about something completely different. See you next time. Bye-bye.